starting on this Friday afternoon. Um, this is a talk I've been looking forward to, um, and I was very excited when Angelina made the contact to be able to bring our speaker here today, Larry God, uh, back to Pittsburgh. He is a Pittsburgh guy. Uh, his dad's been here for 95 years, <laughs> um, and he's here to get to watch his son perform. Um, you know, as we know, this is a this has been a pretty weird election year. Um, um, you know, and I don't know what, else, what other word to call it at this, at this point. But you know, when we started before this year started, before the academic year, and we were obviously really wanting to do some things about the Latino vote because last time the Latino vote was so crucial to to, to the outcome. And so we had several conversations about how to do this and what to bring it. So when you know, Angelina found um, you, know, you and your connection here, we were, we were very excited that you were willing and able to come and, and hear about this. Um, you know, I, what, what role the Latinos will play at the, both at the top of the ticket and, and down below is really interesting. How Florida has obviously changed with the opening of Cuba, or the opening of Cuba in the United States, and obviously the, you know, the rhetoric about the wall and all these kinds of things. And so the turnout will be crucial. Um, and Hillary hasn't uh, garnered as much support in different ways as we know, but it will be really fascinating. I'm really looking forward to this. So thanks very much for coming. Thank you all. I was born and raised here in Pittsburgh, uh, and I went to graduate school here and did my PhD. And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you the story. It's right here, where you are all sitting, the Sports Field, the home of the Pittsburgh Pirates. When I was 14 years old, I worked here, selling hot dogs, selling <laughs> store cards. So this is really a homecoming for me in many, many ways, and I want to dedicate this lecture to my father. Was 95 and three quarter years old. Oh. Now, before I start, I think it's ironic that as we speak to the politics and the madness of this election, uh, I keep I, I follow very closely because I work with CNN's uh, uh, on the issue of Latino vote, and uh, so I follow everything. And I keep hearing on CNN and CNN in Espanol and every other newscast all about. White men who haven't graduated high school, and suburban white women, and others who have graduated college. The Latino book has receded in importance in the public uh, imagination. I don't hear anyone talking about Latinos. So the fact of the matter is, as you will see from today, uh, Latinos in Florida are going to clearly deprive Trump of winning the state, in my, my prediction here. And of course, if he can't carry Florida, he can't win. Presidency. So we're going to get into some demographic stuff, some statistical stuff. I want to issue a word of caution. You're going to be overwhelmed here with a barrage of data. Don't pay attention to it. It's the story behind the data that is important. The data is just evidence for the story. So that's one thing. Second thing, I'm going to do this like a class. Do you have any questions while I'm speaking? Raise your hand and I will do my best to answer them. Okay? Got it? Deal? I have a I did a terrible job of introducing you, honest, honestly, uh, because That's I didn't right. include your affiliations and your, I, you believe, I believe you're working on your fifth book right now. Yeah, um, try seven. Seven, <laughs> okay, I, I got caught. So, working on you know, history in Cuba, um, and the slave trade, uh, agrarian cap capitalism in Puerto Rico, um, and the, mo the most recent one that I've been is, is about Hispanics. Um, and that's why you've been, you've been involved with Cooney the, the, from the program at Cooney, where he's the director of the Center for Latin American Studies and the founder of, the cent of that center, correct? Yeah. Uh, and including this work on, on Latinos and with CNN and Espanol, which is why we've been very excited about bringing here. So my apologies for not doing that. That was a little good. bit better of a job. In we're going to All right. Let's look at some basic stuff. Oh, you have a question? I just wanted to ask you something. Now, Hispanics are the largest minority in the United States today. They end up about 16% of the population. And you mentioned earlier, oh, okay. You mentioned earlier that there's been no attention. Oh, oh good. Thank you very much. You mentioned know, that there's been nothing done in regard to them compared to white women in uh, right. college. Right. And yet it's the largest minority in the United States. Right. I think that the reason is very clear. The polling data. And I think politicians mostly follow the polling data, has indicated that uh, Clinton is going to win uh, a landslide of unmitigated proportions among Latinos in the United States. Romney won 29% of the Latino vote in uh, 
uh, and a more or less according to actual polls in 2012, uh, Trump is now polling at about 12% approval rating. And it's estimated that uh, Clinton is probably going to win close to 80% of the Latino vote. That's, uh, and I think that that has sort of pushed Latinos off the center stage in terms of the news reporting cycle. It's a huge mistake. And you're going to see why. The Latino vote is many things to, and it means something different in different states. Okay, so we're going to get to that. Now, uh, let's look at the demographic data here. The discharge shows you that uh, as of 2014, 17.3% of the population in the United States was of Latino origin. I might add that about 75% uh, were born in the United States. Mexicans are about two thirds of all Latinos. Uh, we have basically a domestic born population despite. Uh, all the ranting and raving and Trump about immigrants and this and that. Only about 25% of Latinos in the United States are actually born outside of the U.S. That's in Latin America and Caribbean. So that's one thing. This data is from 2014 only because the latest census data that's reliable that I use to crunch numbers, I use raw data files, is from that. It's probably ticked up to 18%. Those of you who follow the news cycle know that the Census Bureau is predicting that by 2050, one in three uh, Americans will be percent, uh, and certainly uh, the vast majority will be born uh, in the United States. So this is the basic uh, demographic stuff. It's just going to keep going upward. Uh, why does this one work? This why I don't use apples. This is the right one. I don't know if you jumped in two slides or one. Let me go backwards. Uh, up here. No. Or left there. Let me hit escape. Let me I, I, Apple computers are always mystifying to me. Slideshow uh, they don't take this right All right. So uh, when we look at the voting population, you can see the red line here is the electorate. These are citizens, 18 years of age and over. So we have approximately, and I'm projecting in 2016 based on past. Uh, trends and tendencies, about 28 million eligible voters who are of Latino origin, uh, about only 16 million uh, will be registered, and only 13 and a half million are going to participate in this election. You say you use census data, uh, are you considering all Latinos, whoever marked Latino, regardless of how many other categories they also marked, like myself? Look, all data has a margin of error. I use raw data files to analyze this, number one. Number two, on voting patterns, the database that I'm using here is issued by the Census Bureau. The Census Bureau keeps a meticulous record of voting by ethnicity and race since 1992. And so we have data from every single state. Uh, it is, again, accompanied by a statistical margin of error. So this is what we have. These are the cards we have to, to work with. This is what I'm presenting to you. Is it up and down 5% maybe? We don't know. There's no way to determine that. All right? So we see that we have a big potential voting population, a fairly small actual voting population. We're going to get into that in a moment. Now, uh, back in 2012, uh, Latinos, and I think what you want to really focus on is the green line here, uh, because we'll get to that. Latinos were about 8.4 percent of all votes cast in the election, national election of 2012. Again, they voted 71 percent for Obama. Uh, I am estimating that in 2016, the next month, it's going to be close to 10 percent of all ballots cast are going to be Latinos. And you can project this upwards in 2020. It's going to continue to rise. 2024 election cycles, the Latino percentage of all votes is going to continue to go upwards. And that's going to mean a great deal of political clout uh, with some uh, major caveats. Uh, Latino vote for this election and for all elections is heavily concentrated in Texas and California. And this may be one reason why the Latino vote is ignored by the press. Because these two states, we know that Clinton's going to carry California, and Texas is going to be carried by uh, Trump. Major problem with Texas, it could be carried by Clinton if Latinos voted. Hmm. Only 40% of 
of eligible Latino voters cast ballots in Texas. We're going to get to this participation right in a moment. Then we see Florida. Now, this is the big enchilada here. This is the big unknown. New York is clearly going for Clinton. There's no question about that. Uh, Arizona is not a swing state. Uh, these other states, with the exception of Colorado, are uh, uh, probably uh, going to be defined either way. But you can see here the concentration of Latino vote in two big states, which are not under real, uh, are, are not really going to be contested here. Florida's the big one, and we'll get to that. Now, uh, because the national election is really state-by-state -state elections, here's the Latino percentage of vote in each of these states. New Mexico, the largest, 34%. Surprisingly, in New Mexico, we had a little better turnout rate. We'll talk about that. Nearly a quarter of all voters in California, Latino. Potential voters, this is the electorate. This is potential voters, not voters. Texas, we've got this ticking up to about 25% for this election. 25% of all eligible voters in the state of Texas are Latino. Yet, because of low participation rates, they do not exercise their uh, uh, latent or potential political power, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can see New York, New Jersey, Colorado, Illinois. So these are the big ones. About 78% of all uh, voters are concentrated in these states. So the Latino vote is not a national phenomenon if we went state by state. It's rather a state by state phenomenon. Now, here's the major problem with respect to potential Latino political power in the country. This is the percentage of eligible voters who voted between 1992 and 2005. You hear a lot about voter registration drives, don't you? We hear it all the time. We see NALEO, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials. We see this organization, that organization, La Raza, registering, registering, registering people to vote. It's been a dismal, Failure. Look at this line. 48% of eligible Latinos voted in 1992, 48% in 2012. That's dreadful. Now, the percentage of all elect uh, people who voted continues to increase because of demographic expansion, but participation rates have remained frozen. And here is the major problem facing Latino politicians, religious organizations, civic organizations, people who want to get out to vote. Whatever they've been doing, it's been wrong. Of course, they say I'm a gringo with an attitude and should shut my mouth, but anyway. <laughs> but back into 2012, uh, the participation rate among non Hispanic whites, non Hispanic blacks, that is, eligible voters who voted. Because of Obama's candidacy, non Hispanic blacks uh, voted at a higher rate than non Hispanic whites. Look at Latinos. What happens if the Latino voting participation rate equals this? You've got a new country here. Literally, quite literally, I'm not exaggerating here, and that's going to only increase into the future. Now, here's the crux of the problem. These are voter registration rates. You can't vote unless you're registered, right? Forty-eight percent of eligible Latinos voted, but this is because of the fact that this registration rate, 58 percent, has remained fossilized for two decades. Again, Latino population is growing in the United States, but the percentage of those registered to vote don't vote. The big question is why. Why is this the case? Especially because political participation rates in, uh, in Latin America are so high, many countries are obligatory to vote. Uh, it, it is a mystifying situation. Uh, I can give you a few explanations and positive correlations, but we'll wait for that. All right. Uh, once again, registration rates on Hispanic whites, on Hispanic blacks in 2012, nearly three quarters were registered. Look at Latinos. Once again, back to 58 percent. Uh, differs by state. This is why Florida is so important. Florida breaks the norm. 72 percent. I'm, I'm estimating about three quarters of all authority and Latinos will be registered to vote in 2016 for next month's election. Uh, well above the 58 percent national average. So this is the most important thing. Though. Is that different by um, country of origin? Pardon me? Is that different by country of origin? Is that the Cubans as opposed to Mexicans, for example? 
Uh, you will see momentarily when I examine Florida that the Cuban vote is a big myth. Uh, they're only 30% of the electorate now. Puerto Ricans are equal to them. Another 60% of the electorate, or another 40% of the electorate is not Cuban. The reasons for this, I've been, I've been running a lot of uh, statistical correlations. I don't want to bore you with the results. There, there are three fundamental reasons why Florida and Latinos would register with those higher rates. One, you ready? You're going to see some of this later. Naturalized citizens vote at higher rates than domestic born citizens. About 40% of, Lat of Latinos' electorate in Florida is naturalized. So that's one reason. It's also one of the reasons why in Texas and Arizona, we only have about 14% naturalization level. So for some reason, the best of born, that is US born Latinos, don't register to vote at higher rates. So that's one thing we have in Florida. Second thing, voting registration participation rates are highly correlated to educational achievement. You're going to see, you're going to see a graph on this. That if you graduate college, you participate at a much higher rate than if you don't graduate high school. Florida's electorate is much more educated. That would be a high percentage of Latinos in Florida have graduated college. Third factor, age. Millennials, I hate the term because it's not specific, voted very low. Millennial Latinos voted at about 33% rate. The older you are, the higher participation rate. Florida's Latino population is older. So older, better educated, naturalized leads to higher participation rates. And you find the same thing, by the way, in Virginia. But Virginia Latinos are only about 3% of the voting population. In Florida, they're going to be 20%. Uh, and here you go. I just talked about naturalization rates. Uh, this may seem small, uh, but when your electorate is 40% uh, naturalized, this is, it's a significant. You see the participation rate here, 46% among uh, uh, U.S. born Latinos, 53%. Uh, That's a significant difference here. So the situation is even worse and more paradoxical and complex when you take into account the fact that Latinos born in the United States are even less interested in voting than those who came here and are naturalized. Are you dizzy yet from the numbers? Or you memorized them all? There's a multiple choice test after this. The winner receives a, I don't know what kind of prize. All right, more data here. Age, uh, registration rates. You see 18 to 24 year olds? Aging Latinos register at higher rates. So looking at the whole 58% doesn't tell the story, each state has a different demographic structure. And you have to do a sophisticated analysis of what is the age structure of the population. Now we know that Latinos are younger than everyone else in most places in the United States because of higher birth rates and fertility rates among women. So this is a major problem. Do you have any idea about whites, for example, in terms of age in regard to the comparison? Similar. Very similar. Similar, the similar profile, but not quite as dramatic. If I put all that data up, my father would be asleep by now. I've got to keep him awake here, so that's <laughs> part of the problem here. All right, uh, again, here's the participation rate. Who voted? Eligible voters. Look at so-called millennials. So, uh, and again, you're going to find a similar profile among non-Hispanic whites and non-Hispanic blacks. Not quite as dramatic. So, you know, there's all this, I hear all this on the news about millennials, millennials, millennials. It's a problem. They don't vote anyways. They didn't vote for Obama and, and the same numbers. Uh, maybe non-Hispanic blacks did. So, again, voting rate by age is important. Here's what I told you. This is, this is the voting rates by uh, our registration rates, I'm sorry, uh, by education. All right. Over at graduate college, have an advanced degree, you're not at 48%, right? Now, down here, less than ninth grade, you see, I mean, this is, this is a classic pattern here more education, better voting rates. Now, one of the pieces of good news for the future, I'm always trying to predict the future. Because do that. I retired from being a university professor and we paid a huge sum of money. But uh, what you're seeing in educational attainment levels among Latinos in the United States is that there is still the lowest college graduation 
rain. However, it has increased significantly uh, since 1990-2000. In other words, we have a curve of uh, uh, college graduates are going up, 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 up. It's now at about 18%. Uh, back in 1990, it was about 6 or 7%. What's that mean for the future? Greater educational attainment levels, greater participation levels in elections. Now, we also have a lot of problems. All right, so let's, let's, uh, you have to read this question. Do you have the information for gender? Absolutely, I have information for gender and my nationality. No, but gender. I mean, well, gender is gender <coughs> behavior. Participation. Gender is gender behavior. So let's talk about males and females, which is sex. Yes, I have information about sex. Uh, women, Latinas, have a higher college graduation rate than Latinas, number one. That's one thing. There's a huge differentiation by nationality. Now, you're going to love this. Peruvian, Colombian, Ecuadorian women have extraordinarily high college graduation rates, probably because as immigrants they came here with the greater college. The rate among with Peruvian women, I have this at the top of my because I'm working on it now, is close to 40%. That's off the charts. Dominican and Puerto Rican women or males have a much, much lower college graduation. So Andeans, Cubans lead the way. And of course, female women. Latinas cast about 53% of all ballots among the Latino population. And by the way, that's about the same among non Hispanic whites and non Hispanic So, higher educational levels among Latinas uh, will be a significant factor in the future in terms of participation in the politics. All right, well, I think you had, you had a chance to read this. Uh, let's look at Florida because uh, for Trump, he can't possibly win this election without winning in Florida. And I'm going to show you why. You can breathe a sigh of relief. And when uh, Clinton's going to carry Florida. Because, not because of the suburban white educated club women, because of Latinos in the state. All right, so here's the here's Latino population in Florida from 1990. It's now a quarter, a little bit more, approaching 30% of the total population in the state, especially because of the large scale Puerto Rican migration to central Florida that's been going on uh, as people are fleeing. Uh, uh, Puerto Rico. So here's the basic dem demography. Here's a Latino electorate of the state. 20% uh, of those eligible to vote, more or less, are Latinos in 2016. And I'm estimating that about 20% of the vote will, will be Latinos. Now, here's the registration rate that I was alluding to before. Notice that unlike in the United States per se, voter registration rates have constantly increased. They were 48 percent nationally back in 1996. They're 62 percent. I'm estimating three quarters of all Latinos will be registered to vote instead of voting, and that is very, very significant for this election. Right. And again, <clears throat> Florida Latinos voted 60-40 for Obama. We're going to see some of those slides here uh, in a moment. Uh, and again, this is uh, the participation rate. Now I'm estimating that about close to two thirds of Latinos uh, will vote, and eligible Latinos will vote because of these higher registration rates. And again, stop me if you have any questions on these data. All right, this is what I was alluding to before. 43% of all eligible Latino voters were naturalized citizens. And that is a big factor in accounting for these higher participation rates in Florida. All right, and that's why uh, registration, if, 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 you know, Clinton wants to win, it's a little too late now. But I'm sure that she's, her ground game has been very strong among Latinos, getting them registered, getting them out to vote, especially because of overwhelming support here. Uh, again, I'm estimating 20% of all votes to be cast. A fifth of all votes in Florida are going to be Latino votes. And that's what's going to push the state to her favor. Now, nationalities. You asked me a question about nationalities. 1990, this, the red line are Cubans. This is eligible voters, electorate. The percentage of Cubans, you know, we always hear about the Cuban vote, the Cuban vote, the elections are prisoner of the Cuban vote, uh, American policy toward Cuba's prisoner of the Cuban vote in Florida. Well, the Cuban vote in Florida has increasingly gone down. Uh, now I've looked at some latest data. Uh, the number of Puerto Ricans and the number of Cubans in Florida are about the same in terms of eligible people in the vote. Uh, surprisingly, this may come as a surprise to you, Mexicans are the third largest group in the state. 
So uh, this is not a Cuban state anymore, and as we'll see, uh, uh, persuasion is a non Cuban have changed dramatically. Back in, now this is uh, how many people voted for them, how many Cubans voted Democratic? Only 25% back in 2000. Nearly half of all Cubans voted Democratic for Obama in uh, 2012, and that's because of a generational change. The old Republican, the staunch anti Castro generation is departing the historical stage. Uh, and a new generation uh, without the kinds of uh, Republican leaning beliefs that their parents or grandparents have is taking over. And I suspect that this is going to kick upwards significantly among them. This is just a Cuban vote. So the Cuban vote is no longer Republican, and that's going to come into. Uh, uh, play it on. Now, here you can see preferences. This is this is the way uh, Latinos in Florida voted back in 2012. We're Puerto Ricans, 82% for Obama. Brazilians, Algunos Brazilians are king. Well, it's just a no. Nevada 
Oh, no, I'm pretty sure she'll carry the state. Is Latino vote going to pick up? And again, we're talking about white suburban college-educated women and working-class uh, white men who, who haven't graduated from high school, but why is this being ignored here? This ought to be a topic of conversation. And, you know, uh, I've advised the Democratic National Committee on how to register Latinos, but they don't listen to me. <laughs> they're, they're bizarre. I've advised the National Association of Latino Elected Officials on how to register Latinos, they don't listen to me. They say there's no money. I said, well, okay. All you got to do, and I can do this, is target where 18-year-old Latino citizens live. And get a brigade of $10 an hour high school kids to go and register them. Because in a state like Arizona, 48% of those places, which I can pinpoint on a map, because I do a lot of uh, GIS mapping, I tell you where they live, I tell you where the register is going. You know what they're doing, Aleo's doing? Aleo's trying to turn out registered Latino voters. I went to Washington three weeks ago and I said, are you crazy? I said, 85% already vote. You're only, gonna, you're only talking about a pool of 15 percent when you're talking about a pool of 40-some percent of non-registered voters get from the register. I told them I wouldn't charge that much for it. <laughs> All right, so uh, what you're seeing here, this, this, this swing state, uh, uh, there's a story here to be told here. The story is turnout, the story is registration. Swing states would not be swing states if the larger, especially the larger states of Latinos registered voters. Question. Well, you partially answered this about Arizona. I'm from Arizona. My mom and my sister were trying to register Latino voters. They, they manage apartments. They know where they live. Right. They had an incredibly hard time. They'd spend days and they couldn't get people to register. Right. I'm, so I'm curious about if you have an answer to this of why is it so much more difficult? Are there... I don't have an answer for it. Um, I, I can give you some anecdotal stories from the Bronx. Now, you know the Bronx is part of Latin America. The Bronx is about, they say 52% Latinos really anymore. So I teach, I teach one course a year in undergraduate stuff at the uh, one of the city university campus. My students are all Latinos. Question. Students, how many of you know you have to register to vote in order to vote? 30 students, two raise their hand. Is that anecdotal systematic? That's, that's How many of you know the deadline to register to vote in the state of New York? Now, my college has a system where every student goes online where they can register to vote. And they see it. They have to go online for syllabuses and readings. And they see it. It says register to vote here. They did not know this. Now, these are Puerto Rican Dominican kids for the most part. All right. So whether that absence of information Why would we state that? Is, a, is a factor. I don't know. Sheriff sure, Joe or Biden or, you know. Right, right. Why in a state that is so anti-American, that has had such repressive policies and discriminatory policies toward Latinos, you don't find them stepping up and going to the polls? I mean, apathy, I vote doesn't matter, uh, I don't everybody. know. Uh, uh, it's certainly on, on the, now I have a, I think it reflecting is a reflection of the failure of Latino civic, religious, political organizations and elected officials. Now, if I, when I tell Latinos that, again, they want to crucify me, but you know, whatever. But they failed. If they can't budget 20 years to rate, well, then they're doing something wrong. Why don't they change policies? You see, because those are the people who have connections within communities. It's, it's at the local level that you mobilize people. Now, uh, in, in New York, New York's a Latino city. New York is 30% uh, Latino, all right? probably a little bit more. Uh, you can't speak Spanish in New York, forget about it, you get nothing done. People come to my center, my graduate center, they say, how do you get everything done so efficiently? And I say, well, it's no way you're really complicado. <laughs> they don't know how to speak Spanish. It's, Everyone who sets up the projectors, it's a Hispanic city, all right, in, in New York. Now, I have spoken, uh, the, 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 the head of the New York City Council is Puerto Rican, I happen to know, uh, most of the market, 
There are numerous elected officials in state legislative assembly, numerous elected officials in city council. And I've gone to them and I said, uh, why don't you let me design for you a voter registration drive? Because I deal with this demographic data. I know where Latinos live in New York City. It's a big city. You know what they tell me? They don't want anyone to hear what they tell me, but I'm going to share it with you. So to watch you. I'm not going to bust me on this, all right? They said, we are interested in Latinos who have voted in the past. Because all we know, we want to see voter registration rolls. Because once a person votes, there's a 90% probability that they'll vote again. So when they're designing their political campaigns, Latino politicians, paradoxically, are not looking at bringing in new voters because that's a big question mark, right? That's a maybe, maybe not. What they're interested in, who has voted? Show me the voter registration roll, show me where voters live, uh, and I designed my campaign appealing to people who have already voted. So that may be, in other words, the public posture is we're going to register, register, register. It's not happening, and I think that may be part of the problem. Elect uh, Latino elected officials are looking at uh, uh, those who are already registered. They know they're going to vote. Oh my God. Well, this is just a, a recapitulation of that data. Uh, here's the data on, uh, uh, you know, naturalized Latinos in Florida. Uh, Arizona, you see, it's very low. 83% of Latino potential voters are born in the U.S. And we know that there's this low registration rate for some. Just absolutely an inexplicable reason. Look at Colorado. All right, I think that brings us an end to the statistical world. I've looked at some smaller states, mercifully. <laughs> so, any questions or discussion? Yeah. Yeah, so you anticipated that the vote of Latinos will increase in the future <clears throat> due to higher levels of education. But at the same time, there, there will be a higher uh, number of millennials, Latino, who are voting less. Right. So, how do you know that these trends will not cancel each other out? They might. Don't know. But don't forget, I mean, you have a number of demographic variables that you have to analyze here. What's the rate of aging? What's the birth rate, fertility rate, which in fact is not declining? Um, I think that, that there's probably a good possibility that these numbers are going to pick up in the future. We're going to really know after this election here. If this, if, if, if we can't move the voter participation rate on Latinos above 48% in this election, there's something drastically wrong given this uh, racist, xenophobic, anti-immigrant candidate that's going around screaming and yelling and ranting and raving and behaving like a madman. And uh, uh, if you can't get Latinos, uh, so, you know, I, I, I think we'll, we'll know if trends are going to shift. And, and once again, it's state-driven. California and Texas, Texas is different. California doesn't matter. And that's where the greatest concentration of Latino voters are. I mean, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, because it does matter, especially when we look at legislative assembly uh, uh, elections instead of slow elections. That's a whole other story here. Uh, because if Latinos voted at higher levels in particular districts, we might get some of those Republicans out and Democrats in. And uh, again, to predict the future, this issue of Latino voting becomes more and more important as you're moving toward 2050 in that one in three, you see. This becomes critical because you're looking at, you know, the, what are all the metaphors, the sleeping giant, the this, the that, I read it all the time, uh, but, you know, there's, this, is, this is a ground game at the state level in particular states. And you know what you find, I mean, states, the demographics are mind-boggling. Georgia. You know Georgia's in play? 10% of Georgia's population is Latino. In 1990, that was less than 1%. Now, we have a large number of uh, foreign-born Latinos who can't vote, but because of high birth and fertility rates, the number of potential voters is going to just grow in a place like Georgia. And I, I think Texas. Texas is going to vote Democratic. 
If it's not in 2020 and not in 2024, it'll be in 2028 because you're going to find that basically in 50% 50 of the population is Latino. And so looking at the future, it's obvious that the Republican Party has probably committed suicide, uh, um, which is good news. Um, we can just give them a little push. Uh, <laughs> the world uh, would be a better place. Uh, I wouldn't have any political persuasion at all. <laughs> but in any event, so I mean, this, this is this business of registration is not simply a static issue. It is an issue to look toward the future as something that is going to be extremely important in, in, in election results and southern elections. Your question. Um, yeah. Speak loud. Don't be shy. Okay, sorry. Um, so uh, I guess um, I just sort of want to, I guess point some of some things that I've been observing, especially with like younger Latinos, particularly at Chico. I know we're saying Puerto Ricans. Um, I well, they're like I'm a Clinton supporter, but um, I I did, well, that's good news. <laughs> but um, I have noticed, especially among younger Puerto Ricans in general, disillusionment with um, both candidates, obviously, but even Clinton and even 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 certain extent. One of the things I did notice was that back in 2008, she was very uh, supportive of the uh, statement, and that was one of the things that she promised. Oh. The statement for Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And uh, now um, that's clearly very absent in her uh, nowadays um, because of our economic crisis. So that's something that I think um, you know, is disheartening. I think another thing, too, is that um, when I'm at Mexican, um, I particularly in my master's institution, that one of the things that a lot of the students were mentioning is that. Um, Yes, they're citizens, but their parents aren't. And you know, the parents can attend the graduation, and they were protesting um, the 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 uh, person who gave the speech for the events that it was the uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Homeland Security, and they were protesting. Um, I guess you know, I guess you know, Obama's policies about immigration because he has reported from you. Um, so I think that is contributing to I think a lot of the disillusionment and you know, I guess there's this. Yeah, look, I mean, you, you, you said a lot of different things, some of which I didn't quite understand. I mean, look, uh, the Obama administration's policies for uh, undocumented people has been absolutely dreadful. Let's say quite clearly. Uh, he's the deporter in chief. Why uh, is Mr. Park? And I don't know what that's going to have to, I don't know how that's going to link to voter participation rights. It's, it's, it's a, a uh, disillusionment. On the other, on the other hand, I always tell people this selection has nothing to do with Hillary Clinton. <laughs> really, the selection has to do with a megalomaniac, a madman, right? And anyone, anyone could be a big one of the third party candidates would be better. So, I mean, I don't know the Latinos see it in these terms. See, and I, I don't know, but I, I think the polling data is quite clear. There's overwhelming support uh, nationally, and again, the key thing is going to be the state of Good question. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you have any data about religious affiliation and how no, that played. I don't have any data. Okay. They don't collect that data. There's okay. no systematic data. There's polling data about that, but uh, you know, I, I've not looked at that kind of stuff. It's just based on very small samples. Uh, I'm very careful with the way I use data because I'm looking for large sample sizes. Small sample sizes just don't spit for your reliability of So I don't There was a poll the other day on TV that indicated that 30% of Latino voters in Nevada were expected to vote for Trump. I didn't understand that. It didn't seem right to me. I can give you an I can give you some anecdotal evidence. All right. Uh, not systematic. And this is what I've heard, and I've, I've attended some CNN Espanol big functions in Washington where there's been Trump supporters. The Hillary haters are pretty widespread. She's a slave bag, she's a liar, she's a this, she's a that, she's a this. I think that's one factor. And I've heard this personally 
in the human genome. I think, and, and again, this is anecdotal, not systematic. I think that's one thing. I think the second thing is, and this is, I think, perverse. I really do think this is perverse. That's just my opinion, subjective, of course, reflecting my political views. But I have heard Latinos tell me, but he tells it like it is. And I say, what is, what is it exactly that he tells? Uh, that he's a xenophobic, racist, misogynist, and you like that, that he's upfront about that? But, but I think that that, this, he tells it like, I think it reflects what is uh, generalized in the body politic is something that is irrational, but uh, based in fact, and that is a disgust with the extant system. And I think the Fox News uh, sound bites about this is a great system, and as you know, you hear this, you hear this verbiage. The same verbiage that Hannity uh, vomits, uh, the rigged system, the this, the corruption, now it's an international conspiracy. I'm waiting for the Jews to come in. It's going to be an international Jewish conspiracy by probably the end of tomorrow. Uh, but uh, you see, I think that that strikes a resonant chord among some Latinos, that they don't have any perspective at all about uh, the past, the present, uh, and certainly I think, you know, that's not really an answer, it's simply speculation. I'm going to get into something else that was over there. I was going to say, I, mean, I think another part of the answer is partially going back to your question, that the Latinos are not a homogeneous group. Right. And there are policies that matter, whether it be statehood, whether it be abortion, these kinds of things, which you hear a number of them commenting about. So who are going to appoint the Supreme Court, and that's all the care of yeah, I mean, you really do have to, I mean, in, in the bottom particular, you have a 80 to 90 percent population that's in the Mexican descent. Almost, uh, 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 probably close, um, uh, over 85 percent born in the United States. These are people born and raised here. And so to some extent, they have incorporated the kinds of attitudes that are generalized among the rest of the world. And I think that's, that's what you used to explain that. Now, I'll tell you something even worse. In Ohio, where Latinos are only about 3% of the voting population, now, that could be significant in a tight election, 46% voted for Romney in 2012. 46%. Now, I happen to know that Ohio Latinos are in working class areas, um, uh, in Cleveland, uh, in Toledo, uh, and you know, again, that's a pretty high percentage because that breaks the mold in terms of the national average. So why are Ohio Latinos voting predominantly, I mean not predominantly, but significantly high rates of Republican voting in 2012 and so far? Another interesting question, what will happen this year? Ohio is a swing state. Three percent of their voting means something, especially when you have, you know, I mean, Obama carried Florida by 0.9 percent of the vote in 2012. 0.9 percent of the vote Obama won Florida. So, question. Yeah, it's it's pretty much a comment. Um, I'm being here. I'm a permanent resident here in the United States for. Um, but, well, I'm, 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 I don't know, almost in years. But the thing is, I think one of the facts that we don't vote, I'm not eligible to vote right now, but I'm gonna do it eventually as soon as I'm being a citizen, it's the culture that we bring from our countries. A few countries in Latin America actually, we learn to go and vote with your family, or your family tell you to vote, or you learn in front of school. We don't, we don't do these things, because we're coming for that, dem uh, for a, a political culture that only grown-ups can go and vote, or it's not our decision. That can be one of the facts. And another one is, and now I'm thinking, in the process, the whole process that, since I become from student, exchange students to permanent resident, I never get a paper to say, oh, maybe keep in mind to vote for your citizenship here in this, you've at never, least in you've Pennsylvania. You've never received any kind of? No. Nothing. Well, no. So my only difference, because that's the question to me, I'm being like holding. Should I be Ameri should I become American or not? Because the whole benefits I have it is the same. The only thing I cannot do is vote. 
but I have all the benefits of a permanent resident. Well, I would invoke the following. We look at the history of humanity. Mm -hmm. How many people and how many cultures had the right to vote to choose their leaders? Mm -hmm. I think it's something to be cherished, to be honored, and I would highly encourage you to look at the rest of humanity, and even in contemporary times, and see who has who has who has this opportunity to actually make a difference. Yeah, your, your vote matters, especially in Pennsylvania. So get citizenship. Plus that passport, you can go to a lot of places. Well, yeah, I guess. But you know, I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, see, that's. What, what you're, you're telling me is what you're doing, and I don't mean to uh, be any, any kind of, I'm just being analytical. You're, you're, you're discounting the importance of the right to vote. And what I'm telling you is that's an important right, because I hear this all the time. My vote doesn't matter, my vote doesn't matter. How many yeah, votes did George W. Bush win the state mm -hmm. of Florida by in 2000? 520%. The history of the world would have been radically different had 528 Latinos voted who didn't. Do you want a more graphic example about why your vote counts? No, I haven't that clear yet. <laughs> Another question. Yeah, in terms of representation, like now it's uh, more clear that the Democratic Party is the one that is going to advance more the interests of the Latino voters. Don't you see a problem there that it's a captive vote? Uh, the same with African Americans. Like, uh, most, a uh, vast majority of African Americans will vote Democratic. Uh, but, so what are the incentives for the Democratic Party to keep them? Because they know that they will have this vote. I mean, I think that's a good question. I mean, what kinds of policies are the Democratic Party going to uh, enunciate that's going to be beneficial to Latinos and not, not just assume that they're going to vote? I think number one, and this is the big issue in this election, is the Supreme Court. The next president is probably going to name two to three members of the Supreme Court. If Clinton was re-elected in, in 2020, maybe even more. We should only hope that, well, we don't want to wish uh, cast dispersion on any members of the Supreme Court, except for a few that I can name personally. Uh, but uh, what happens to voting rights? The Voting Rights Act was, was repealed by the Supreme Court. This is one of the most preposterous, most preposterous things in, uh, that events that has occurred in modern uh, U.S. juridical history. Now, I worked in the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. Uh, I, uh, the, the, the struggle to pass the Voting Rights Act was monumental. Now, Voting Rights Act is not just for African Americans, it's for Latinos as well, because of notorious efforts at voter suppression in uh, particular states across the United States. So I think that's one area, guaranteed basic rights. And I think that the Democratic Party uh, uh, should not take for granted the, uh, the African American or Latino vote by any means. It has to articulate policies that are real, that are going to be beneficial people. I'm not a politician, I'm just simply analyzing the data, so I'm moving into the political world. I think it's a really good question, and I think that without any ambiguities, the fact that you may have, over the next three decades, one in every three voters may be Latino, is an extraordinary incentive for every political party to, uh, to articulate policies, programs, pass laws that are going to benefit
your uh, or statistic called the data, how much they care about their I mean, how how they define themselves as a, a team or just the United States citizens. So this can be the first question. And the second well, one, well, no, wait, wait. One more time, one time. You know, I'm getting all over my capacity to digest the information. Uh, look, uh, as Scott mentioned, Latinos are not monolithic. They may have different nationalities. Mexicans comprise two thirds of all Latinos in the United States. Puerto Ricans are the second largest group, and they're basically uh, influential in particular areas: New Jersey, New York, Florida, uh, to a lesser extent Pennsylvania. Dominicans are large in eastern Pennsylvania. Now, in terms of ethnic identity, you're opening up a huge can of worms here. You're asking some very complex questions about Latino communities and how people see themselves and how that changes generation to generation. Mm -hmm. There's not one particular answer here. Uh, quite clearly, people who are born in a particular country have a particular framework for understanding their lives and for identifying themselves. Uh, what is most common, of course, is the utilization of national terminology. I'm Mexican, I'm Ecuadorian, I'm Peruvian, I'm this and that. Now, second, third generations, fourth generations, uh, their conceptualization of who they are and what their identity is change. And quite clearly, the whole concept of Latino is an externally imposed uh, definition of an identity. It's why people don't understand that in fact Argentinians and Mexicans are very different and Puerto Ricans and Bolivians share very little in common. Uh, they call it, it's an externally imposed, but it's been internally accepted by younger generations. What are you on Latino? But no, no, where's your parents from? Oh, yeah, well, Puerto Rico. Now I see this in my dealings in New York City all the time because I've, 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 I hate to say that I'm teaching so long in New York City, I've taught grandparents, parents, and children. <laughs> Literally, I have a student who's a grandchild, a student who was quiet back in 1980-something. So, uh, and the younger students, they identify as Latinos. Now, what's that mean in terms of political participation rates and in terms of voting choices? I, don't, I can't tell you. But we do have this major problem of registration and voting participation. An anthropologist can unravel this and make some appeals to identity, gender, the other, whatever it is. Fine. Second question. Uh, do you think the, the racial those Latinos who register to vote will stay uh, in current status in the future as well? Or do I think? <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. I, I intuitively, logically. Rationally, one would expect that registration rates would go up. I mean, no one is deaf, I assume. Uh, I think that, that Latinos across the country have certainly observed uh, the anti-immigrant, anti-Latino, the xenophobic, nationalistic, racist pronunciations of this madman. All right, and uh, to not respond by registering would be mysterious at best. So uh, I'll come back here in January after the data is released by this and I'll let you know. But it would be a great disappointment if it doesn't tick up above the 58%. I would expect to see in the lower 60s. I would expect to see now. That doesn't mean that. One way to partially answer that question in the longer term is and we showed that the, 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 young, the young voters, or uh, young citizens are not Right. Registering or voting, right. but those they don't stay young forever. Right? <laughs> I mean, they, right. you know, they are cohorts and they get older right. and then they should right. register. And, but what but what would go against that philosophy is your then you show it's a horizontal line for 20 years that there hasn't been right. an uptick right. in the registration. So you know, something that doesn't add up there, right? That means that there that the that the cohort that's been um, socialized at one point is registering at a lower rate than their forefathers. Right. Were, were doing. Well, you may have hit on. Maybe the demographics of the Latino population in the United States uh, much, much younger than the rest of the population. Like significantly younger. And, and in other words, if you look at the age pyramids, uh, for those of you who do social science research, uh, it, it's, it's very, very heavy at the bottom, the bottom levels. Now, what's, what's happened is those people are going to age. And not only that, the fertility and birth rates among Latinos is starting to decrease. And so you're going to see 
a slightly older population in the next decade or next two decades, and then they translate it to higher rates of political participation. Uh, along the lines of what Scott was saying, you were saying on ethnic identity, <clears throat> the younger population that eventually will become voters uh, later. You showed charts 20 year span, considerably one to two generations in terms of voting age. Um, from what I see anecdotally, uh, being a foreigner here, new generations tend to assimilate. There's a different rates of it, <clears throat> depending on the level of education, country of origin, different things. And I'm wondering if that uh, younger generations, two, second, third generations, are not marking I'm Latino, but I'm suddenly in the white category, so they, they are not showing on their stats as Latinos, but on the other side, maybe that's an explanation. You're very concerned with statistical reliability, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not looking at the numbers. I know it's, it's very complicated. Well, uh, a little bit of everything. We don't talk about Irish right. Americans anymore in terms of voting. Uh, I, I think, once again, in terms of data, and let me respond the same way I responded to your previous question. That may be the case. It's a but, but evidence seems to indicate that, in fact, Latinos do check off Latinos. And that uh, people even go to the, to the extreme of writing in. There are only three checkoffs for Latino nationalities. Mexican, Puerto Rican, and Cuban. Every other national group has to write in. Salvadoreño, this, that, Brazil, this. Okay? But <coughs> evidence suggests from the data that I analyze is that that is very widespread. So I don't think that this is, and, and, and the other thing is this, if you study demography at all, you can get a, 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 uh, a very clear uh, uh, understanding of the data when you see particular yearly growth rates. And if we look at yearly growth rates, not overall growth rates, among Latinos in the United States, and we factor in what we know about migration, it's pretty much reliable. In other words, you're not seeing some crazy uh, low yearly growth rate of 0.5% or some high yearly growth rate of 3%. You're seeing what would be expected in a population which has a particular age structure, a particular fertility and birth rate, and a particular level of immigration. So I think that the census data does have a margin of error. It's not precise, but it is fairly accurate in terms of looking at percentages of overall population, states, age structures, uh, national origins. I mean, that's my opinion. And uh, again, how is that related to what we're talking about here? And that is political participation levels. <coughs> that's the key. Because you are really looking at a sleeping giant here that will change the face of local politics and national politics in key states if the participation rate was high. Now, Texas and Arizona are at the forefront. Uh, Florida is quite clearly, obviously, has been so critical in every single election. I think those three states, uh, Colorado and uh, I don't think it's going to much matter in California. Yeah, I have a question about the issues that are so now the immigration issue is the most salient one. Right. But then, so without Trump, in the future, will like other social issues like abortion or um, I mean, I know Latin America uh, in general is a very religious region, like Catholic, the majority of the Philippine Catholicism, and. So will they become more conservative if they don't care about immigration anymore? <laughs> I mean, that's a good question. I don't know. But look, look what we're dealing with here. First of all, for Latinos, the number one issue is immigration status. Mm -hmm. If we make the assumption that the estimates of 11 million undocumented people uh, are accurate, uh, maybe a little higher, maybe a little lower, how many of those people have family members who were born in the United States. In other words, you're talking 11 million people. Now, let's, let's keep this in perspective. We're talking about a Latino population of the United States of approximately 55 to 60 million people. We're talking 20% of the Latino population. Now, if we do a little fiddling with the math and look at children born to undocumented people in the United States, we may be talking about 30, 33% of the population that would be affected by 
uh, these uh, insane uh, deportation uh, around the mountain pack and then trains away. So immigration reform, someone asked me about what Democrats could do to help Latinos push forward immigration reform to legalize uh, undocumented people. And you're going to get the Democratic vote for about uh, three more generations to come. I think that's the number one issue. I mean, look, I, you know, I live in New York. Uh, City University of New York admits undocumented people. We don't discriminate against people with documents, undocumented people, with respect to admission or with respect to financial aid. We're probably the most progressive university system in the country. We have 20, I saw like an advertisement here, we have 400,000 students at City University of New York. We have 29 campuses, right? Close to 40% of our students are on here. How many are undocumented? We don't know. But in my conversations in New York City, this is the number one issue. Number one issue is legalization. Number one issue is don't break up families. So, I mean, you get a Clinton presidency, uh, and depending on what happens in the Senate and House of Representatives, I can't see, and I'm going out on a limb here, how are they going to continue to subscribe, the Republicans, I mean, the obstructionist uh, set of policies that they perpetrated against Obama for eight years? Are they going to continue to marginalize themselves from such issues as immigration reform? Now, that, this is going to be the big question in the aftermath of this election. How crazy uh, are the, the, is the Republican Party going to be? Because all Trump is is the personification of every single thing that they've been saying for eight years. You know, he's Republican style. I mean, he is the, uh, he represents, in graphic terms, the Republican Party. He is the Republican Party, whether you like it or not. They've been muttering this below in, in Soto Voce for eight years now. So what's going to happen with the Clinton presidency, even if she doesn't win the Senate or House of Representatives? Are they going to continue uh, this kind of madness to sabotage such issues of immigration reform? Now, that's the big 64,000 year question. Because I can't see, in a political sense, any benefits from that. They're going to take a drumming in this election. She's going to win an electoral landslide, uh, unless uh, something crazy happens in the next three weeks. What's that going to tell them with respect to the, the question of affect Latinos? That's the real issue here. So moderate Republicans, look, George W. Bush, as reprehensible as he was, excuse my uh, opinion, <laughs> Favored immigration reform. It's the lunatic fringe of the, that became the mainstream of the Republican Party, the Tea Party, and all these other xenophobic, uh, white nationalist, all right people who opposed it and couldn't get it through. But even Republican politicians uh, can somehow realize that this is this is something that has to be has to be affected. So I think that's part of the answer to your question. You do immigration reform, it's not like you're counting on the Latino vote. You've shown the Latino population uh, that, that this is something that is that, why it's worthwhile electing Democrats. Would it be the same income level or educational level? Do Latinos still remain the lowest ethnic group in terms of the level of political participation? I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good question. I see where you're going. And your, the next question is about the political persuasions of higher, education, higher income Latinos. Uh, let me just say a quick, quick note about that. Latino populations, not only are not homogeneous with respect to nationality, there is a clear, I forget I should use this word, class structure in Latino communities. Uh, okay, he's not a Marxist, he's not an economic determinist. But in any event, what I'm saying is here is that you have the image of poverty is a false one. All right, 30% of all Latino households in the United States earn greater than $100,000 a year. 30%. However, 50% of Latino children live in poverty. In other words, we have a very stratified community, and that affects political uh, it, it, Calling it a community is also a stretch here, but a uh, sector of the population is highly stratified, like every other sector of the population. Now, 
How does that impact on the social stratification, income levels, educational levels? How does that impact of political persuasion and voting patterns? I don't have the answer to that. I don't have the correlation to that. We don't have data on voters according to uh, income levels. Just one thing. I'm going to use my prerogative to ask the last question, but I'm going to cede my time to your dad. But okay, he has a question for you. Your question. Yeah, I have a question. <laughs> 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 so I won't be able to answer this. Why, why does Trump get so many votes from people that are that their votes are based on hatred of Hillary? Why does Hillary engender so much hatred? Give me an analysis. We're going to speak about this in private. <laughs> I don't really have the answer to the question. Look, people voting against their own economic interests is not something new. Uh, demagoguery, uh, appealing to the lowest forms of, uh, uh, of, of human behavior is not something invented by Donald Trump. Uh, there was a uh, guy in the 1930s in Central Europe who wanted to make his country great again. Um, remember that guy? And he advocated uh, deporting people who didn't belong uh, to, uh, uh, in fact, to death camps. Uh, but the Latinos go insane when you tell them that. And, and I, you know, again, it, well, I, don't, I don't know the answer to the question why people are so uh, imbued with hatred and resentment and, and this and that. But I, I do know that sadly some Latinos buy into this stuff. And I've seen it firsthand. Of course, I. I don't know the answer yet. We'll talk about this over lunch, dinner, and whatever else we decide. All right. Now, here's a political pundit. You get to be 96 years old. You better pay attention to this guy. I listen to everything he says. I'm not 96 yet. All right. <laughs> I just want to thank you. Uh, we don't get a chance very often to talk about this. Uh, all I can say is it's good to be home. <laughs> I love Pittsburgh. Uh, but, you know. so, thank you again. I mean, like I said, start to say we don't get a chance to talk about current politics. People right. come to the day data, we'll really analyze it.